good afternoon uh, one and all so this is our third session on uh, neurology and probably the last session of neurology uh, today we'll discuss on common diseases of spinal cord and neuromuscular junction in dots so just before going into the proper diseases of uh, spinal cord just we have a, a gross idea of a uh, neuromuscular of spinal cord Uh, so as you all know the spinal cord is divided into uh, five divisions one c1 to c5 which is called the cervical cord then c6 to t2 cervical thoracic cord t3 to l3 thoracolumbar l4 to s3 is the lumbosacral the other one is the caudal one caudal segment uh, which includes the sacral and coccygeal combined so a majority we will discuss on on only this four first four uh, divisions of the spinal cord and um, as you all know the lmn the lower motor neurons uh, are located in the cervical thoracic as well as the lumbosacral cord this enlargement we call it as a cervical enlargement this is a lumbar enlargement or you call it as a intumescence this one and this one where all this uh, spinal nerves uh, i mean the spinal nerves which continues as the uh, peripheral nerves it starts here c1 to c5 actually carries the umn for the c6 to t2 as well as down so just you recollect the uh, earlier uh, class on basics of uh, umn and lmn the upper motor neuron whose neuro i mean the cell bodies the neurons are located in the cervical cortex and the axons run down and gets connected to the spinal cord the role of upper motor neuron is to initiate and control the lower motor neuron activity the lower motor neurons are located in c6 to t2 that is a cervical thoracic cord as well as that is for the four limbs for the hind limbs it is located in the lumbosacral cord and just before every cord it carries its umn umn in sense that is the axons connecting from the upper motor neuron so a umn for four limbs and hind limbs are located above c5 up to the brain the umn for c6 to t2 is above c5 and the umn for t3 to l3 is above t2 t2 is the landmark and the umn for lumbosacral cord l4 to s3 it is just above this that is right from the thoracolumbar cord up to the brain so the what is the role of lmn lmn does the activity that activity is initiated and controlled by umn and uh, we will go into the segments divisions of the spinal cord now so these are the spinal cord divisions just a minute i have some electrical problem here just a minute so these are the divisions of the spinal cord again so the red marked one is the cervical cord that is c1 to c5 and uh, this is in relation to the vertebrae so if you look at it c5 is almost the c5 vertebrae is almost related to c6 so always a spinal cord will be ahead of the vertebrae it won't actually relate just above it always ahead of the vertebrae the spinal cord that means the spinal column the spinal divisions are is a little ahead of the vertebrae that's why the spinal cord in l6 below l6 we don't have spinal cord in, in case of canines so c c1 to c5 is the cervical cord which carries the umn for both fore limbs and hind limbs that is the axons of the umn and c6 to c uh, c6 to t2 which is a cervical thoracic cord carries the element for the four limbs and umn for the hind limbs that is the axons of the umn next comes your uh, thoracolumbar cord which carries the <clears throat> umn for 
hind limbs that's the axons <clears throat> next comes the lumbosacral cord which carries the element for the hind limbs <clears throat> and doesn't have any element <clears throat> the, the <clears throat> sorry that's a sacral cord <clears throat> Now we go into the clinical findings of the different sections of the spinal cord. So if you have a lesion in the cervical cord, that is between C1 and C5, <clears throat> you will have crossed extension reflex in all four limbs. That is, if you do a withdrawal reflex, <clears throat> just I'll demonstrate with the video what will, what will happen. So if you do a withdrawal, that limb just flexes. That's a normal withdrawal. Suppose if, see, I'm doing the withdrawal in other limb, this limb stretches out. This is called cross extension. This is a regular withdrawal is the first one. And that is the cross extension. <clears throat> okay. That is about, it. You, you, you will see cross extension in all four limbs. You will have neck pain. You will have Horner's syndrome. I have discussed on the Horner's syndrome in the earlier session. <clears throat> of course, you will have proprioceptive deficits. Your uh, conscious proprioception, other uh, reflexes will have a deficit. Yeah, these reflexes you can refer to the earlier uh, uh, sessions. Then you will have uh, all the my, uh, spinal reflexes, mitotic reflexes will be exaggerated because uh, the human is involved. The human for forelimb as well as hindlimb is involved. So you will have exaggerated reflex or normal to exaggerated. Then you will have a tetraparesis, that is weakness or a para paraplegia. I mean, tetraplegia of all four limbs, not paraplegia, tetraplegia. Then you will have increased tone in all four limbs since uh, the human is involved. And the bladder will be an upper motor neuron bladder. These are the signs of <clears throat> cervical cord. The cervical cord carries human for Forelimbs as well as hind limbs. Coming to the cervical thoracic cord, C6 to T2, which carries the LMN for forelimbs and UMN for hind limbs. So once uh, there is a lesion there, you will have absence of the cutaneous truncate, which is the sensory one. And you will have neck pain. You will have decreased tone in the thoracic limb. The thoracic limb reflexes will be reduced, actually. Normal to reduced. Uh, but the pelvic limb reflexes will be exaggerated. And you'll have crossed extension reflexes of the pelvic limb, what I demonstrated in the video. Then you'll have proprioceptive deficits. You may have hornos. You may have tetraparesis or tetraplegia. You will have increased pelvic limb mitotic reflexes. The spinal reflexes in the pelvic limbs will be uh, exaggerated, normal to exaggerate. Whereas the forelimb reflexes will be uh, reduced. And you will have an upper motor neuron bladder, uh, bladder and the increased pelvic limb tone will be there. Coming to thoracolumbar T3 to L3, um, there will be an absence of cutaneous truncae near the level of lesions. You can just, the adjacent part will have the lesion if you do a uh, cutaneous truncae. And animal will have paraparesis, that weakness of hind limbs or paraplegia. You will have ex cross extension of the pelvic limb since the lesion is in the human for the hind limbs. You may have back pain and there may be proprioceptive deficits in the pelvic limbs and also the increased spinal reflexes, mitotic reflexes will be more in, in the pelvic limb since uh, the T3 to L3 carries human for hind limbs and nothing for the four limbs. You have to remember that. Except for shift sherington, uh, that I'll discuss now. Then you will have an upper motor neuron bladder and there will be an increased pelvic limb tone. And coming to the lumbosacral cord, that is L4 to S3, it carries element for the hind limbs. So you will have a decreased anal tone or reflex, you will have an element bladder and you will have a decreased uh, pelvic limb mitotic reflex. All the spinal reflex in the pelvic limb will be normal to reduced, not exaggerated, since the lesion is in the element. And you will have a lumbosacral pain. You may have a lumbosacral pain. There will be decreased pelvic limb tone as well as the withdrawal reflexes, all of those reflexes. And uh, you will have paraparesis or paraplegia. 
but this will be a flaccid paralysis. What you see with T3 to L3, it's the uh, spastic paralysis. What you see in L4 to S3, again, it's a paralysis, it's a flaccid paralysis. Uh, the pelvic limb proprio deficit, there will be proprioceptive deficits in the pelvic limb as well as the tail. Coming to Sif Sherrington, suppose there is any trauma or a lesion in the thoracic lumbar cord, a traumatic lesion. It can be an interval disc prolapse or it can be a contusion or it can be a ischemic, that is, uh, infarcts, any type of trauma. There are some cells in the uh, lumbar enlargement, that is, in the lumbar incumbents, that is, the, where there are, uh, there are cells called border cells, which has a control over the extensors of the forelimbs. So when there is a lesion in that uh, area, the forelimbs, normally the forelimbs shouldn't have any issue because the forelimbs have no much connection with the uh, thoracolumbar area, except for shift Sherrington, where there is border cells, which has some control over the extensions of, extensors of the forelimbs. Once there is a lesion in the thoracolumbar area, <clears throat> this control is released. So there will be a, a stretching of the forelimbs and the hind limbs will be flaccid because of spinal shock. So you will see a stretched forelimb and a, a flaccid hind limb for uh, a few hours to days. Then after that, the forelimb becomes normal. The hind limb should become stiff. Hyperd Pharma introduces its herbal range, Hypyrin tablets. Natural and safe, antipyretic and anti-inflammatory. With the benefits of Giloy, Sot, Vach, Muleti and Musta. Natural and safe, antipyretic and anti-inflammatory tablets, Hatpyrin tablets. Indications Fever of multiple etiologies. Post-surgical procedures pain management. Painful condition like acute sports injuries. Osteoarthritis and juvenile arthritis in pets. Menstrual cramps in bitches. Dosage for small breeds, one tablet once a day. For large breeds, two tablet once a day. For cats, half to one tablet once a day. Root oral. Presentation: one into ten tablets. You can book your order online at www.hatwit.com. Looking forward to a long-lasting business association. Thank you. <clears throat> this is called Shif Sherrington phenomenon, which happens in thoracolumbar injury. Okay, now uh, we'll go into the disease proper. First, uh, well, most common disease you all know is the intervertebral disc disease. <clears throat> Intervertebral disc disease means it is it happens because the de degeneration of the intervertebral disc structures. This discs because of the aging or because of uh, inherited phenomenon, it becomes uh, weak <clears throat> and subsequently herniate the disc material into the vertebral canal. That is compress over the vertebral canal. It can happen in two ways. One we call it as Hansen type one, other one is type two and type three. Usually two ways are common. That is. <clears throat> that is extrusion of the nucleus pulposus through the annulus fibrosis. Annulus fibrosis is a cover, covering, fibrous covering, and inside is the nucleus, which is the nucleus pulposus. And this ruptures and extrudes the nucleus pulposus. That is, that is Hansen's type 1. If without rupture, just the protrusion of the annulus fibrosis happens, that is type 2. And sometimes without any compression, just the disc will explode and a small quantity, small volume of disc will be herniated out. Uh, that is called type 3, which is uh, which doesn't have much compression. <clears throat> this is the uh, internal disc anatomy. You can see the nucleus pulpose inside and this is the annulus fibrosis. And uh, coming to the intervertebral disc, you all know the intervertebral disc uh, between every vertebrae, there is disc. This is a cushioning one uh, between the vertebrae. And the cervical disc will be circular and the thoracic uh, disc will be a little oval and the lumbar will be more bean shaped. And the disc will have, as I said, and each disc is bound 
cranial and quadrally by uh, hyaline cartridges, vert vertebral uh, end plates. It's attached to the vertebral end plates. And dorsally, ventrally, two uh, longitudinal ligaments run parallelly. And uh, there is another ligament called intercapital ligament, which uh, connects uh, uh, between T2 to a T10. And uh, it, it holds the intervertebral disc because that will be crossing over and it holds the disc. Uh, that's the reason uh, the, there is less incidence of uh, disc herniations uh, between T1 and uh, between T2 and T10. So most commonly it happens uh, between T11 and L3. So actually what happens is, <clears throat> so just before going into actually what this kidney, how it happens, uh, type one disc, uh, the, uh, interval disc disease is common in chondro dis dysplastic breeds or chondro dystrophic breeds, dashians, beagles, cocker spaniels. <clears throat> it is because of the chondrite disc degeneration. And um, usually this degeneration occurs uh, almost before one year of age. And the uh, signs will be very acute in onset. Even degeneration happens, but actual protrusion doesn't happen so early. Maybe later in the middle age it happens. Uh, it is associated with the onset of acute signs. And most often you see mineralized uh, nucleus pulposus. In type 2, intervertebral disc disease is seen more in uh, older large breeds, achondrodystrophic breeds, large breeds. And here the degeneration is fibrous metaplasia rather than the chondroid uh, degeneration. And uh, type 2 disc disease is slow, progressive, uh, slowly progressive, and the spinal cord compression is also doesn't happen acutely, it happens very slowly. Actually, what happens here is the uh, this, uh, description for that. This is the interval disc, and that green one is the spinal cord. What you see is inside is the nucleus pulposus, and the surrounding one is the annulus fibrosus. <clears throat> That's a vertebrae. That's a spinal cord. This is type one, where the nucleus pulposus extrudes out and impinges on the spinal cord from below. Whereas, uh, it, sorry, whereas in type two. Actually, there is no uh, extrusion of the nucleus pulposus, just pushes from inside, and there will be protrusion of the annulus fibrosus in the spinal cord. This happens acutely, but this happens very slowly. This is more common in uh, your chondrodystrophic breeds, whereas this is in a chondrodystrophic breeds, in larger breeds. The same thing in the <laughs> longitudinal section you see there. That is the impingement of the intervertebral disc. The blue one is the disc, and the green one is the spinal cord. These are the ventral roots, and this impinges and creates a compression of the spinal cord. So what will be the clinical signs in case of uh, intervertebral disc disease? If the type 1 disc disease usually happens between the age of uh, 3 to 5, as I said, the degeneration happens quite early in young age. Before one year, uh, almost 7,500 the disc it gets degenerated. The extrusion happens around 3 to 5 years of age. <clears throat> Whereas type 2 happens a little older and, um, and happens very slowly. And the signs of the interval disc disease, uh, it, it depends on which part of the spinal cord is involved. And that signs I already have listed what will happen when there is an involvement of cervical portion or a cervical thoracic portion or a thoracic lumbar or a lumbosacral portion. So signs depends on which area is involved. So usually, uh, the cervical disc disease is uh, occurs only for 15 percent of cases. 85 percent of cases is the thoracolumbar disc disease. There are two typically between T11 and L3. Why T11 and L3? Because the intercapital ligament is from T2 to T10. So very commonly happens between T11 and L3. And the severity of signs ranges from pain, paresis, ataxia, um, and of course uh, paralysis. And, so, and if the lesion is very severe, it goes uh, to the loss of nociception. That's the deep pain perception is lost. <clears throat> then how will you diagnose the intervertebral disc disease? Uh, the first one will be a plain radiograph. That's what you're going to take. You see a narrowed intervertebral. This is the radi normal uh, intervertebral canal. And that is what we call it as a seahorse appearance of the intervertebral space. And that is the canal there. And see the narrowing happens. Since the disc gets, a, disc moves to the top, 
uh, you have the narrowing of the uh, vertebrae, intervertebral space. And uh, here you see the, this is the intervertebral disc, nucleus pulpus, which is calcified. And this disc is protruding into the canal, into the spinal cord. And here it is almost impinging on it, not protruding deep into it. So those are all uh, calcified uh, uh, nucleus pulposes. <clears throat> and the problem with the plain X-ray, you cannot lateralize lesion, which side it is involved. That is very difficult with it. The other alternative and more uh, comfortable and conclusive evidence comes with the uh, myelography. Of course, uh, uh, its accuracy ranges from 72 to 97 percent, and with the lateralization, it is 50 to 100 percent almost. So here it's very clear. This is the uh, dye you can see there, and you can see the impingement here. This is because the, it's actually it's a calcified disc. It can be quite visible in a blind radiograph, but you see here, this is moving up, and that's the dye. You see the course of the dye. So the next alternate will be your uh, computer uh, tomography, which is uh, more sensitive and uh, it's an obvious one as you all know. You can use as an adjuvant to myelography or you just uh, do as a sole diagnostic procedure. If you want to avoid myelography, this is a blind one and you, this is a mild case. You see, this is a moderate one and this is a severe experience. So almost uh, more than 50% of the Spinal cord is compressed here. <clears throat> Next one will be your uh, contrast CT. If you want, you can use a contrast CT also. And that is the dye you see here. It's almost like X ray only. And you see the impingement here. And that's the transfer section. That's a normal one. And this one, that is a, a protrusion of the disc into the spinal cord. That's the MRI of it. And uh, again, you see, there is a clear impingement you can see there, the MRI. Okay. Now, what is the non-surgical management of interval disc disease? It, uh, the idea is to resolve the inflammation and to prevent the further herniation of the disc material. How to do it? You simply put down in the cage rest for six to eight weeks <clears throat> so that it won't run and jump. Uh, and move around and uh, in almost 70% uh, dogs which are weak and paralyzed still um, you have a good sensation in the affected limb that is the deep pain is good 70% uh, of dog recovers and the overall recovery time is from 12 weeks that is before they walk we even after recovery it may have some uh, uh, residual neurological deficits like slightly wobbles rear limbs because the most common area involved will be your uh, T11 and L3. Suppose if the animal have lost the sensation, if there is no deep pain, then only 5% of the dogs uh, make a good recovery with the uh, non-surgical management. So, Hadford Pharma introduces its herbal range, Immunohad syrup. Immunomodulator, anti-infective and phagocytosis enhancer. Natural immunity modulator with the benefits of Guduchi, Ashwagandha, Punarnava, Shatavali, Methika, Arka Parni and Haritaki herbs. Immunomodulator, anti-infective and phagocytosis enhancer syrup, Immunohat syrup. Indications? Helps in improving the phagocytic index and results in faster recovery. Regulates the immune system response and promotes healthy skin. Pre and post vaccination in pups and immune compromised animals. As an adjuvant with antibiotic therapy. As a supportive with steroidal therapy, especially in skin infections. Dosage for small breeds. 1 to 2 ml twice a day. For large breeds, 2 to 3 ml twice a day. For cats, 
वन एम एल ट्वाइस अडे रूट और प्रेजेंटेशन हंड्रेड एम एल यू कैन बुक योर ऑर्डर ऑनलाइन एट डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट हार्डवेयर डॉट कॉम लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड टू अ लॉन्ग लास्टिंग बिजनेस एसोसिएशन थैंक यू Really, you have to prefer. So, deep pain is uh, the one which uh, gives the prognosis, whether it, and also uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, to decide whether to go in for surgery or to go in for a, a conventional management. Of course, medical management is uh, your non-steroids like carprofen. You can use some few uh, course of steroids. Can use muscle relaxants like diazepam. You can use a gabapentin or a pregabalin or tramadol. Suppose there is a, a involvement of the bladder. Suppose it's a human bladder. Then naturally, to relax it, you have to use a prazosine or phenoxidensin, along with a, a diazepam or baclofen. The idea of these two things is one is a smooth muscle relaxant, the other one is a skeletal muscle relaxant. So if you want to relax the internal of the sphincter, you have to use a, a prazosine or a phenoxidensin. And if you want to uh, relax the external urethral sphincter, you have to use diazepam or baclofen. If it is an element bladder, then naturally you need a, a battery call, which is a detrusor contracting agent. Okay, just I just give up what really what they do during surgery, but I'm not a surgeon. I cannot explain much about it. But you see, this is the aerial view of it. That part of the uh, vertebrae is removed. That is what we call it as a hemilambectomy. Okay, and you want a side view. This is almost a side view of it, but here we call this as a pedicolectomy because uh, the article of acid will be preserved. You won't damage it because to maintain the stability of the vertebral column. Um, if the entire thing is removed, we call it as a hemilambectomy, one side. The articular facets are preserved, then we call it as a pedicolectomy. That is to have the stability of the vertebral column post surgery. Um, that these two are common. The other one we call it as a dorsal amnectomy. The dorsal amnectomy, it is uh, the whole of dorsal spine will be removed, so that uh, the spine. Uh, see, it's impinging here, and you have pressure here. If you remove it, the spinal cord will go up, and there is no much pressure from the uh, extruded disc. That's basic idea. We call this as a decompression techniques. So either you do a hemilamnectomy or a pedicolectomy or a dorsal amnectomy. Sometimes you do the slotting. This is called ventral slot. More commonly, in case of a uh, cervical involvement, they do ventral slot. And more for the thoracic lumbar, they do hemilamnectomy or a dorsal. Ectomy. So this is the opening. Okay, coming to the prognosis of the intervertebral disc disease. Um, in case of a, a, a paralyzed dog with good sensation on the rear limb, the non-surgical management is 70% and surgical management is 90%, of course. That's the right dominant. And the recovery time in case of a surgical management is one to four weeks, whereas in non-surgical management, it will take six to 12 weeks. If there is no sensation in a paralyzed animal, there, then 5% of dogs only recovers from non-surgical management. With the surgery, almost 50 to 60 percent of recurrence. Um, the recurrence can happen in case of a non surgical management, which is very high, whereas in a surgical management, the recurrence is very meager. Okay, that is about the in general about the internal disc disease. The next common value of your uh, cervical spondylomyelopathy, or what we call as a wobbler syndrome, usually in case of dogmans, you see this. <clears throat> it's usually a disease of cervical spine of large and giant breeds. And this cervical spondylomyelopathy can have an, uh, can, uh, is characterized by dynamic as well as static compression of the cervical spinal cord. I'll discuss what is dynamic and what is static compression of a cervical spinal cord, nerve roots, or both. So there will be a neurological deficits as well as neck pain, depending on the degree of compression. Okay, there are a lot of synonyms for the cervical spondylomyelopathy. We commonly call it as a wobbler or a caudal cervical spondylomyelopathy, cervical spondylopathy, cervical spondylopathy, the disc associated compression, cervical vertebral instability. A lot of these uh, synonyms are there. 
just you can have a look at it okay etiology what happens the etiology is still unknown but uh, it can be a genetic or it can be a congenital malformations uh, uh, body conformation or it's related to nutrition so usually almost all breeds are involved but more common in case of more common in case of dobermans dalmatians vibranus and usually it happens after three years of age and the commonly affected intervertebral region that is the, the cervical region is c6 to c7 uh, next will be your uh, uh, c5 to c6 so 90 percent of dog will have a lesion either in c6 to c7 or c6 to uh, c5 to c6 okay Coming to the pathophysiology, I said that there will be a static as well as a dynamic factor involved. Static is there will be a, a vertebral crown stenosis. So that is a static factor. So you cannot enlarge the canal. It's a stenosis canal. It's a malformed canal. And the disc protrusion is the dynamic factor, which happens uh, because of the degenerative uh, discs. Okay. So the disc uh, associated compression can happen as well as the osseous associated compression can happen. Osseous in sense, uh, because of the vertebral mole formations or because of the osteoarthritic changes happening in the articular process, it can compress statically, whereas the dynamic compression, why we say dynamic is the compression depends on the position of the animal. Sometimes we put the animal in different position, it may have, it may have pain. So the in, in, impingement will be more uh, uh, with the positions. And apart from the disc compression, it can be complicated by either by the vertebral uh, canal stenosis or hypertrophy of the ligamentum flap. We'll see what it is. See, this is a picture of the disc associated compression. You closely watch here. Um, here, this is uh, almost normal. Okay, coming here, you see here, there is a protrusion of the vertebral disc. And there is a hypertrophy of the uh, dorsal ligament, that is the yellow one, and as well as the ligament of flab in the top part. So, so spinal cord gets skews between uh, this one and this one, both from top as well as from down. That is the dorsal, that is the uh, dorsal longitudinal ligament, that is a ligament of flab, and this is the spinal cord. That blue, light blue, is the extruded disc. The other one, this is an asymmetrical. You see, the extruded disc is almost on one side. So there, there are more of a, a nerve root compression than the spinal. A part of the spinal cord is compressed, but it's more of a nerve root compression here. So this is called disc associated uh, cervical uh, spondylomyelopathy. So coming to osseous associated compressions. So here you see the <coughs> severe uh, osseous mole formations here. Sideways, so the disc compressed almost uh, uh, the lateral side is compressed, it's laterally compressed. That's a normal one, okay. Here, also, you see the osteoarthritic changes. So, and there also there is a stenosis of the uh, vertebral canal, so everything looks compressed here. So, this is this compression is because of the bony changes. Um, it both can be together. There will be can be an osseous associated compression as well as the uh, disc associated associated compression. Okay. So, onset of clinical signs is gradually progressive over several months or years. Sometimes it happens acutely also, but rarely it happens. And uh, usually it begins in the pelvic limb and then progress to tetraparesis. Uh, the signs will reflect C1 to C5 or uh, C6 to T2 compression. Um, neck pain is common in Dobermans, but in other breeds, it's not so common. So maybe in Dobermans, neck pain is not a classical sign in case of Dobermans. They say Dobermans, it has a neck pain commonly. And of course, the uh, radiography will uh, show you the mall alignment, uh, remodeling of sclerosis of the vertebrae, narrowing of the intervertebral disc brace, degenerative changes of the articular facets. You can go in for a myelography to see how, how much uh, the neural compression involved, whether it's static or uh, dynamic. 
can go for CT or MRI to identify the spinal compression. And that is the radiography which is showing osteoarthritic changes here. For now, this between C4 and C5 as well as the uh, C5, C6 and C6, C6 and C7, you can see the changes. <clears throat> Uh, therapy for dogs with my signs will be very conservative as you are, as you know you can use steroids you can use a carprofen you can go for exercise restriction or you can go for uh, surgical techniques like ventral slotting ventral distraction and fusion uh, with or without ventral slotting or you can go for a dorsal amplitude okay Hatfit Pharma introduces its herbal range, Hatpyrin Syrup, natural and safe antipyretic, analgesic and anti-inflammatory. With the benefits of Guduchi, Sunthi, Vacha, Yashti Madhu and Musta Herbs. Antipyretic, analgesic and anti-inflammatory syrup, Hatpyrin Syrup. Indications Fever of multiple etiologies Post-surgical procedures, pain management, painful condition like acute sports injuries, osteoarthritis and juvenile arthritis in pets, menstrual cramps in bitches. Dosage for small breeds, 1 to 2 ml twice a day. For large breeds, 2 to 4 ml twice a day. For cats, 1 ml twice a day. Root oral presentation 60 ml you can book your order online at www.hatwit.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you so coming to discospondylitis so discospondylitis is an infection of the vertebral end plates and associated interval disc so disc as well as the end, vertebral end plates are involved. Where you, where, how you get the infection is through the hematogenous route or from the urinary tract or from the oral cavity or from the heart, in case of endocarditis, or from the skin lesion. Anything can cause this. And even a foreign body migration uh, can introduce bacteria when which migrates to the vertebrae. Sometimes after a spinal surgery or after a paravertebral in injections also, you get a discospondylitis. That, that is very rare. And what is the causative organism? Mostly it will be a Staphylococcus pseudo-intermediates or the Staphylococcus aureus. And less commonly, you will have E. coli, uh, Streptococcus, E. coli, as well as the Aspergillosis. Some you rarely see Brussels canis also. That is also an important infection agent. Even the incidence is low, but it, in every case you have to rule out a Brussels canis because of its zoonotic potential. You cannot take it light. So every case of a discospondylitis, you have to uh, rule out a Brussels canis. So it occurs mostly in intact uh, uh, middle-aged uh, male, so in large as well as in giant breeds. You can have a single area involved or in multiple sites. The most common area will be L7 to S1 IVD, intervertebral space, intervertebral space. And the clinical sign uh, reflects where it is located. If it is in the thoracolumbar, accordingly, the hind limb will show the signs. If it is in the lumbosacral, accordingly, you will see the signs. Um, spinal uh, pain may be the initial sign in most of the cases. Uh, sometimes the animal is present with spinal pain, then first thing you have to rule out is the uh, Discospondylitis. Approximately 30% of the do dogs will have systemic uh, illness like fever, weight loss. In chronicity, you see weight loss. And clinical signs may be present for several weeks and months before diagnosis. So, since uh, the science is very uh, mild and slowly progresses, uh, owner, owner may not bring it to you early. How, how do you diagnose it? Uh, it is through an X-ray where you see the uh, narrowing of the disc space. Of course, you see that. <clears throat> you see the end plate lysis as well as you see the sclerosis. Okay, and of course, you see the end plate lysis. So, uh, uh, vertebral end plates will be very much involved here. 
Okay. So diagnosis, uh, usually you can do a urinary culture, uh, urine lysis, or you can do a blood culture. Uh, if you do a blood culture, you get a 70 percent is positive, and urinary culture also 50 percent is positive. So if you, uh, almost 10 persons are, percent of the cases uh, has brucellosis. So better to do a brucella testing uh, because of its zoonotic potential. Coming to treatment. Um, so antimicrobial use the, is the main strategy. And if you can't do a culture and sensitivity, then what you do is you go for a direct empirical therapy uh, again, uh, staphylococcus, which is the most common one, start with the cephalexin, cephazolin, or uh, amoxicillin. If the science is very science is very acute, then you can use intravenous uh, antimicrobials a few days, then switch over to oral. And the uh, course of treatment may be uh, uh, six to eight weeks. It will be a prolonged therapy. And the dose is also a little high compared to the normal treatment because it needs to get distributed to the and usually this uh, the signs will resolve in two weeks but uh, neurological deficits may, uh, deficits will take longer time to go back suppose if it is not responding to your first line of treatment then you go to the second line of antibiotic like endofloxacin at 5 to 11 milligram doxycycline 25 milligram trimethoprim 15 milligram if you suspect a fungal one or if you have cultured a fungal one then you can think about using a flu console Okay, that is about discospondylitis. Okay, it's an uh, inflammatory infectious disease of the spinal cord. So you need an antimicrobial treatment there. And it is diagnosed tentatively with a radiograph and uh, uh, later confirmed with it, your culture and sensitivity. Then comes your spondylosis deformance. Spondylosis deformance is a chronic degenerative non inflammatory disease characterized by production of the osteophytes. We don't call it as osteophytes, we call it as uh, enthesophytes. So there will be a spur formation or sometimes uh, there will be a bridging of a uh, vertebrae across the entire disc. So it is a degenerative change which happens uh, because of the changes in the vertebral disc. And, uh, secondary to aging or to trauma. And this disease reported in uh, usually in about two years and uh, more in case of an old dog, as you all know. So because uh, it is more in boxers, uh, there it possibly there is an inherited factor there, especially female boxers. Although all breeds are affected, you commonly see that in boxers. And the most common area will be L7 to S1. Next comes your uh, thoracoloma, T12 to L3. And uh, type 2 disc disease and the spondylosis uh, deformance is associated. So most of the time you think spondylosis deformance is causing a sign. It may not be. It may be a uh, type 2 disc disease. Type 2 in sense, uh, you, have see, you, uh, you see this in the uh, larger breeds at older ages. Clinical signs of uh, this one, spondylosis deformance, it's usually there will be no clinical signs. Okay. And uh, there is no much pain also. There won't be much lameness. There won't be much neurological deficits. If it is there, then you have to suspect uh, type 2 internal disease, internal disease. <clears throat> and uh, this bone spur won't expand, expand into the vertebral canal and therefore it won't compress the spinal cord and cause neurological deficits. So as such, it doesn't require much treatment. So this is uh, the uh, spondylosis deformance and you see this spurring and this is bridging. This is complete bridging and that is, maybe you can call this as a grade one, this is a grade two and this is grade three, you can call this. And you can do a grading also. I'll just show you how they do a grading. So this is a clean one. That's grade zero. Absolutely no. That is a small spark there. We call it as enthesophytes. The end plates. And this is grade two. It's almost touching the 
next vertebrae, but not connected. If it bridges, then we call it as a grade three. This, you have to differentiate this from something called DISH. DISH is nothing but diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Um, you can see this. This is almost a complete bridging which happens. But whereas uh, your spondylose deformance is not like that. And here, the mostly your uh, uh, longitudinal ligament is completely fused. It happens in case of DISH. Diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Uh, mostly it happens with pure breaths and then more anger there. Okay. So you have to differentiate between dish and spondylus deformance. This dish may show some stiffness and the pain in the lumbar spine. Whereas a spondylus deformance is uh, without any signs. That is dish. It's complete whole of the vertebrae. Whole lumbar cycle is almost uh, fused here. Okay, that is about uh, uh, spondylosis deformance. Then coming to degenerative myelopathy. So degenerative myelopathy is a slowly progressive non inflammatory of spinal cord consisting of axon degeneration and demyelination. So it happens very slowly and the synonym is chronic degenerative radicular myelopathy. So still the etiology remains unknown. There is a, there is some immune-related degeneration. And earlier they thought it's a disease of German Shepherd. Later uh, they reported in many breeds. So it's common in German Shepherd, but also seen in other breeds also. Um, the pathological changes is seen throughout the spinal cord, mostly in the thoracolumbar area. Hatwit Pharma introduces its herbal range. Hatblad tablets. Powerful tool to induce platelet formation. Carica papaya extract. Tinospora cordifolia extract. Goat milk powder. Wheatgrass extract. Kiwi extract. Pomegranate extract and vitamin E tablets. Hatblad tablets. Indications. Lower platelet count, tick-borne viral infections and antioxidant. Dosage for dogs, body weight less than 10 kg, one tablet once a day. Body weight more than 10 kg, one tablet twice a day. Root, oral. Presentation, 1 into 10 tablets. You can book your order online at www.hatred.com. Looking forward to a long-lasting business association. Thank you. Um, see, this is a video of a, a shepherd having a, a, the swaying of the hind limbs. It's a weakness of the hind limbs, you see, how it says, of course. It's the beginning and slowly it progresses as it gets aged. Okay, so the signs are usually non-painful, uh, very slow in onset, that is insidious, very slow in onset and progresses to, uh, that will be progressive ataxia and uh, finally the paresis of the periparesis and finally they end up in paraplasia. Uh, so it happens over a period of months to years and that ultimately leads to bladder incontinence. Okay. And the early sign will be a reduced patella reflex. That's very difficult to find out the early sign. But you will see some degree of uh, paresis in the hind limbs. Especially in case of German Shepherd, it happens. It can be a degenerative myeloid. It's also recognized in uh, Welsh Corgi boxers and other breeds also, as I told. And it's a disease of old age dogs, more than nine years usually. So it's only a tentative diagnosis you can make. Very difficult to... Uh, pinpoint. Sometimes you see the increased protein level in lumbar uh, CSF tab, but that's not a conclusive evidence. Um, maybe if you go for a CTR uh, myelography, you may see a uh, atrophic spinal cord, but that is not a record. Uh, once you rule out other reasons, then you can stick on to this. 
So no much effective treatment is needed. Only by nursing, uh, they say amino caproic acid may help to some extent and acetylcysteine. But long-term prognosis is poor only. It will progress and finally they end up in paralysis and uh, bladder dysfunction. Okay. So next comes your uh, fibrocartilage and embolic myelopathy. Uh, it is something like a spinal stroke. So it is an obstruction of the vessel supplying the spinal cord because of the emboli from the uh, intervertebral disc, the fibrocartilage disc. So uh, many theories are there, but nothing is proven. See, the fibrocartilage emboli includes artery, that may be the primary reason, especially to the left meningeal areas, that is to the uh, coverings of the spinal cord. As well as to the spinal cord pattern, both. Okay. And mostly it is a it is in the a control dystrophic breach. Control dystrophic breach from medium to large size breach. That's more commonly predisposed. And more commonly, that enlargement area in tumors in is involved. So this is uh, one such case. Usually the clinical signs are per acute in onset because it's something like a, a trauma, but this trauma is because of an infarct. So it is an acute spinal cord injury, which happens because of the uh, ischemia, because of the infarction of the spinal cord. And so it is per acute in onset, non-progressive, non-painful. If it's an, a contusion or a concussion, it will be a, uh, a painful one. And usually it is asymmetric. One, one side of the spinal cord is involved. Um, of course, you will see all those progressive deficits, ataxia, very rarely you see paralysis in this. If you support the animal, it may work. This is the one such a classical case you see. Appropriation this, appropriation deficit. This animal is still able to walk. Okay. Uh, you see the other limb. Okay. That is a clear appropriation deficit. Then this limb. That it's correcting the other limb. So it is a unilateral deficit, unilateral project. And she is doing again. That is a clear professor deficit. This is the other hind limb, which it corrects it. So there is a conscious proprioception on the right side, and left side is more involved. Okay, so and uh, coming to that uh, clinical signs of it. So most of the time the lesion is in the lumbar enlargement or the family lumbar enlargement, um, and this happens immediately after a, a, an a exercise, acute a jumping or a violent movement. This happens. Um, so usually the neurological deficits uh, will peak in 12 hours time and subsequently it gradually improves over the period depending on the degree of involvement. If deep pain is lost then you can give a poor prognosis. Deep pain is present probably it carries a good prognosis and there is no specific therapy for it but some they are still using a methyl sodium succinate which is no longer recommended in case of any spinal trauma or in case of uh, intervertebral disc disease, or in case of uh, uh, FCE, that is a fibrocartilage by myelopathy. So here, uh, why it is not recommended is because uh, the side effects are more than the benefits. So that outweighs the benefits. That's why it is not recommended. Usual uh, protocol, you know, to, to start with, you have to give around 30 milligram IV, uh, followed by 15 milligram in two and six hours. Then you have to do it uh, every, I mean, continue it four times a day, maximum 48 hours. After 48 hours, there's no point in continuing methyl uh, prednisolone. Methyl prednisolone, sodium succinate, that is a drug, but no longer it is recommended because of its side effects. It will induce a severe pancreatitis, uh, gastric hemorrhage, diarrhea, so many uh, colonic perforation. So usually it carries a good progress this disease without even treatment just don't bother just do a proper nursing that's all um, if there is a lack of deep pain then it carries little uh, poor prognosis just a supportive care a physiotherapy hydrotherapy that's 
very good. Hydro, it's a fit phase a case for hydrotherapy. The prognosis of this one is very good. So 85% of the cases will uh, walk in three weeks time without doing anything, simply nursing, 85% of the cases will walk without steroids. I mean, don't use steroids and say that it happened because of steroids. It, it would have happened even without steroids. Okay. Um, steroids in sense, high dose, I mean, giving methyl, prednisone, sodium, succinate, high dose, that is around 30 milligram. That's what I meant. Um, So even after having some uh, uh, neurological deficits happening, if the deep pain is absent, uh, then the recovery rate is as low as 20%. So with the good deep pain, you have 80% recovery. Deep pain is poor, only 10% recovery rate. Okay. Then comes your acute spinal cord injury. So uh, we, it doesn't mean there should be a blow to the spinal cord. It happens. Uh, it can happen because of intervertebral disc disease. It can happen because of the, a trauma due to automobile accident or a gunshot. Or it can be an infarction as happens in the fibrocartilage. So those two already we have discussed. So we'll just stick on to the trauma of the spinal cord. In canines, this is the order of incidence. Whereas in case of uh, felines, uh, trauma comes first. Okay, the first step will be uh, taking the history and find out the reason behind that, especially in case of trauma. And um, uh, then uh, if, if you think it's a it's because of trauma, your manipulation should be as little as possible. And uh, first see whether the animal is quite stable, then address the neurological deficits. It's respiration, it's hydration, everything is important. Put it under oxygen, hydrate it properly with that. Uh, that is the reason behind that, because uh, the primary spinal cord trauma is one thing which causes the damage. The secondary complications are, uh, or the secondary factors are uh, more important uh, in the progression of the spinal cord injury. So you do a neurological examination if possible, a minimal neurological examination to localize where the lesion is. And if there is no obvious trauma or uh, no obvious instability of the vertebral column, then you can think about uh, internal disc or uh, FCE. Okay. Then you put it, uh, put the patient under a radiographic discrimination, identify this sensibility. Before, then if you, you are free, there is no vertebral fractures, there is no spinal compression much, then you can uh, do manipulations of the patient. If you have options for going to CT, MRI, well, good, you can do, do that. Or you refer to a place where they have it. So once you see a patient is not stable and a history of trauma is there and you suspect the instability of the vertebral column, then you brace the patient uh, or you just tie the patient like this to a board and see that that board is a, a radiolucent board so that you can lift it and take the x-ray as such without removing it. Just tie it, make it uh, quite stable. Uh, and okay. So first thing will be your uh, rest and uh, appropriate uh, pain management. And then looking for the stability, uh, it's, uh, you can just go for uh, braces or bandages. And, uh, and if you need surgery, then you have to proceed to surgery. Okay. So coming to the, the the secondary pathology, secondary in sense, even after contusion, the local changes which happens in the spinal cord, the local increase in iron concentration, disturbance in the blood flow, ischemia, production of free radical, what you call it as a reposition injury, that is a major factor which uh, leads to the progression of the spinal cord injury. Um, so better you address this. So uh, this is the consensus uh, arrived by the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. The MPSS has not been recommended, that is methyl prednisone sodium succinate has not been recommended as standard treatment of care, nor as a guideline. It is considered to be an option with acknowledgement that adverse effects are more consistent than clinical benefits. So it means better avoid methyl prednisone sodium succinate. Hadwit Pharma launches its Hadpod range. Hadpod Cephodoxime 100mg, 200mg disposable tablets 
Cefpodoxime 100 mg per 5 ml oral suspension. The safe and effective choice for stubborn infections. Cefpodoxime Proxital Disposable Tablets. Hardpod 100 dt and Hardpod 200 dt tablets. Cefpodoxime Oral Suspension. Hardpod 100 ds. Cefpodoxime Proxital 100 mg per 5 ml. Indications. Cefpodoxime is used in both dogs and cats to treat a variety of bacterial infections including skin infections, wound infections, bone infections, pneumonia and bladder infection. Dosage for dogs 5 to 10 mg per kg once daily for 5 to 7 days. For cats 5 mg per kg once every 12 hours or 10 mg per kg once daily. Root Oral Presentation 1 into 10 tablets For syrup 30 ml You can book your order online at www.hatwit.com Looking forward to a long-lasting business association. Thank you. Okay sir, this type of trauma that is using high doses like 30 mg per kg body weight. The other potential therapies will be your uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone. These are all uh, tried and tested things. Not very effective, but has something to do with uh, uh, improvement of the spinal cord trauma. Your peg, your polyethylene glycol. Then, you, uh, of course, if you have no options for bone marrow stem cells, you can do it. Aminocyclic erythropoietin. Your calcium channel antip uh, antipodes like uh, nifedipine, all those things. Uh, it is related to the blood supply to the spine. Your free radical scavengers like vitamin E, selenium. Your NMD antibodies like uh, that is all for oxidative stress. For example, your ketamine it can help to some extent. Okay, so that is about the spinal cord injury. Um, then comes your neuromuscular disease. All this time you were. Uh, uh, concentrating on the spinal cord disease. Now, uh, myasthenia gravy is a uh, disease of neuromuscular junction, not a spinal cord disease. Uh, and of course, acquired myasthenia gravy is an immune mediated disease, whereas a uh, congenital one is usually an inherited and uh, inherited factor in the congenital one. And there is no treatment for that. The acquired one is uh, there is an auto antibodies formed against the acetyl called receptors in the neuromuscular junction. So instead of acetylcholine, these antibodies will be occupying it and acetylcholine gets secreted and get destroyed there. Um, so there won't be any neuromuscular transmission, there won't be any muscle contraction. That is the basic uh, mechanism happening. And uh, usually it is uh, it affects a dog of 6.5 years of age. Bimodally distribution, bimodal distribution is it can happen in three years as well as it happen in 10 years of age. Usually it will be your uh, golden or labrador retriever, which more, more formally involved. Then comes your Akita, miniature dash, and Scottish terrier, your German pointer, collie, all those things. If the dog is less than one year, then um, you uh, no need to think about uh, acute Okay, there are four subtypes of it. One is the focal one, which can uh, occupy, uh, involve only one body area, usually esophagus, uh, face, throat. If it's generalized, it involves usually all skeletal muscles. So sometimes it will be in the fulminating, it rapidly progresses and goes fatal. That's fulminating uh, type of acute myasthenia gravis. And it can be paraneoplastic because of the tumor of the thymus gland. Okay. So usually in the generalized myasthenia gravis, you see an exercise uh, induced fatigue. So animal, if you walk for a short distance, then it goes down. And there may be megaesophagus, there may be white change, there can, there can be a laryngeal paralysis uh, or a dysphagia may be there. Um, usually it's an exercise induced weakness. Okay, uh, this is a classical case. Just I'll run a video of it. There will be external distance. See, it walks for some distance and sits down. Okay. Uh, that, then it's not getting up. Uh, that fellow is pulling. He's a 
uh, it's not able to walk he's just pulling it this fellow is lifting it uh, lifting it it walks for a few steps yes okay this is okay that's a classical case i why i'm saying it uh, after a few days of treatment with pyridoxine when i'll show you the video of the same case so how to diagnose it you have to test for antibodies for estrogen colon receptors which is not possible here tensilon test you can try that if you get it but we don't have access to a hydrophonium chloride so if you give the shot of hydrophonium chloride it works very strongly and normally then uh, once the drug effect is over then it goes back to uh, stage of myasthenic phase and in thoracic radiography you can see a megaesophagus you can see an aspiration pneumonia you can see a tiny tumor perfect okay just uh, so coming to the treatment of uh, acute myasthenia gravis so it, it, the main stay of your treatment will be your anticholinesterase agents that is uh, your in this anticholinesterase agents will uh, allow the acetylcholine to stay in the receptor for a longer time so that it has some action on the neuromuscular junction uh, once the uh, the antibodies gets aged and drops out okay so pyridostigmine is the drug of choice because uh, Uh, no need to give it often. Uh, you can face it as well early, and more uh, preparations are available. You can start with 0.5 to 1 milligram, and you can increase up to 2 milligram, or you can use a neostigmine bromide. In case of canines, uh, generally we don't go for immunosuppression since it's an immune disease. You have to go for immunosuppression, but that is common in case of felines and canines. There is no need to go for immunosuppression. Just stick on to pyridostigmine, and it's only a symptomatic treatment. The slowly disease will. Uh, it will it can recover from the disease after some months okay so until then you have to see that it, it is not regurgitating uh, it doesn't develop an aspiration pneumonia secondary to regurgitation suppose if it is a case of a, a thymic tumor induced uh, myasthenia gravis uh, and the mega esophagus then you have to remove the tumor okay so going back to the same case so see the video before this is before pyridostigmine Before pyridoxine treatment, it's not able to walk few steps. Uh, okay, so this is after uh, three days of treatment. Pyridoxine, same animal. It is an uh, it's on pyridoxine treatment. Same fellow, same animal. okay so um usually the cure is spontaneous and the prognosis is good if the animal is able to survive that uh, period of uh, uh, severe regurgitation weakness uh, especially when there is a mega esophagus there always there is risk of developing aspiration pneumonia if it can withstand that uh, thing um it, it is spontaneously cures after few months okay sometimes it will take even years to improve but Maybe you can wait for eight uh, to twelve weeks uh, for it to improve. This case it dramatically improved after a few days of medication, and uh, we reviewed after two months. It was doing very well. Okay. The next uh, common neuromuscular disease, not common, but you see mostly in the rural as well as in suburban areas. You see this. This is because of uh, you all know about it. Uh, the suburban areas, uh, the butchery shop or whatever the meat shop, uh, they throw away the bones and all no the stray dogs picks it up and develops a, a botulism from it it can be from the spoiled food or uh, from the uh, stuff i mean uh, chicken legs or from any meat stuff spoiled so it is uh, some, it's something like an intoxication not actually an infection so what happens actually is it develops uh, initially this this is one such case so this dog uh, fed with the chicken legs from the butcher shop so it acutely developed this type of signs uh, let's see it's a, it's wobbling it's not able to move properly it's a, it's having a quadriparesis okay okay it's almost 
looks as if like a rabbit dog okay but and uh, but surprisingly so once we evaluated this one okay so this one you see the x-ray the same dog you see a, a mega is vegas here and you see the uh, bones chicken bones there you can see the chicken bones inside the stomach the stuff is there and uh, this case was uh, in fact uh, simply managed with antibiotics and the fluid therapy you know almost 10 days time it uh, completely recovered from it but usually botulism and intoxication is too high it is usually fatal but uh, these cases if you treat it properly in the early stage uh, and uh, mostly it is related to this type of uh, bone related botulism then the probable recovery rate is more usually it's a very um, it carries a poor prognosis. Thank you. Hadwit Pharma Private Limited is a pharmaceutical company with its head office at Meerut. It was founded on 29 January 2019 with a vision to provide affordable and quality veterinary medicine to our pet parents. Hadwit Pharma is doing marketing of veterinary pharmaceuticals throughout India. In a small span of one year, we have launched 51 products in the veterinary pharma industry to serve our clients. In future one year, we are planning to have a product basket of more than 100 products. Hatwit is different from other veterinary pharma companies as we don't have distribution channel. We understand the latest needs of market and for this reason we have adapted to online module of selling our drugs to field practitioners. We are serving our clients by providing the required medicines at their doorstep, without any middleman. We directly collect orders online, mobile app, WhatsApp, telephonic from our end customers and we deliver the required products to their doorstep through our nationwide logistic partners Blue Dart, DTDC, TCI Express. We are happy to announce that in our client list, most of the leading pet practitioners of India are included. To assure the unbreakable faith of our clients in our company products, we look after the quality of products, starting from selecting the raw material for our final products, aseptic precautions during manufacturing, and proper storage of finished products till supply to the end customers to ensure quality of products. We are happy to share that Hatfit Pharma has been recognized at various business platforms. Recently, an article on Hatfit Pharma has been published in the leading business magazine, Business Connect. One more milestone in the success story for Hatfit Pharma is that the managing director of the company, Dr. Rajneesh Tyagi, has been awarded Young Asian Entrepreneurs Award at Bangkok, Thailand on 7 February 2020. Our vision states Hatfit Pharma to be a commercially viable leading veterinary pharmaceutical company in providing quality products affordable to various sections of the pet owner society. Our endeavor is to be a front runner in innovation and quality in the veterinary pharma industry. We see a very bright future for our company as we are working in pet industry which itself is growing at a higher rate, approximate growth of 20% annually. We are regularly working on the knowing of needs of our customers to serve them in a better way. We value your support to Hatfit Pharma and are very thankful to all of you. We look forward for a very strong and long business association between veterinarians and Hatfit Pharma. Thank you.